The United States democracy is built on the idea of balance. Balance between the branches of government, balance between the political parties, and balance between the free states and the slave states? Well, at one point, yes. Early in our nation's history, an uneasy agreement existed between states who enslaved others and those states that forbid such a practice. But this balance would be challenged at several points in history as each side sought to tip the scales in their favor and determine the course of our country. Slavery is a tragic, gruesome, and unfortunately true element in our country's history. Motivated by greed and power, slaveholders bought, sold, and owned human beings for their own gain. And it's no surprise slave owners didn't want to give up that power. The slave power conspiracy was the belief that a small group of wealthy slaveholders were secretly working to gain control of the federal government in order to make slavery legal in the entire country. But was it true? Today we'll be looking at the time period between 1820 and 1860. This period of time is called sectionalism because, well, the United States was really divided into sections based on economies and occupations. We had the North, whose 11 states had industry, railroads, and big populous cities in common. These states were anti-slavery. And then there was the South, whose 11 states were based on large plantations and farming. These were the slave-owning states. So we're pretty balanced, 11 free states and 11 slave states. But there's a third section as well. These are the territories lands that are being settled as our country expanded, but were not yet states. That is until Missouri decides, being a state sounds fun, I'm in. Missouri wanted to join the Union as a slave state, which the South was pretty excited about, but the North did not like. The 12th state would throw off the balance of power, so a compromise was needed. The answer? In 1820, Congress admitted Missouri as a slave state, but also admitted Maine as the new free state. Balance maintained. They also went a step further in an attempt to solve future problems. Congress decided that in any future state north of latitude line 3630, slavery would be banned. This was the Missouri Compromise. So we're all done, right? Of course not. What appears to be a solution at one point in history doesn't always remain that way. A series of events occurring between President James K. Polk and the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 would increase the slave power theory and ultimately lead us to the Civil War. But in order to understand Polk's election, we need to spin back a few years to 1836. This is when Texas won its independence from Mexico and established the Texas Republic. At the time, Texas wanted to become a state, but the U.S. feared a war with Mexico, so Texas became the Lone Star State, waiting for the U.S. to annex them. Annex means to add as an extra part. In this case, it meant the United States adding Texas to the country as a new state. The election of 1844 pitted James K. Polk against Henry Clay and was centered on whether or not Texas would be admitted as a state. Ironically, Henry Clay was known as the Great Compromiser, and he played a major role in the Missouri Compromise that had added Missouri and Maine and balanced the states. In this election, however, Henry Clay met his match. Polk ran on an aggressive platform of not only annexing Texas, but also claiming all the land to the Pacific Ocean. Polk advocated fighting Mexico in the South for Texas and fighting Great Britain in the North to take the Oregon Territory. 54-40 or fight. You see, 54-40 was the northern border of the Oregon Territory at the time. The desire to claim all of this land to the Pacific Ocean was later coined Manifest Destiny. After his election, Polk instigated a war with Mexico, which the United States won. That victory gave the United States all of California and New Mexico, 
And by 1853, the Gadsden Purchase completed the continental United States. And by pairing Texas as a slave state and Oregon as a free state, President Polk managed to keep the slave state, free state balance. Oh, and for what it's worth, after he was elected, Polk softened on the 54-40 or fight mentality, and the U.S. and Great Britain compromised to split the territory at the 49th parallel without any fighting. Polk's one-term presidency radically changed the size of the United States, and soon settlers traveled west to find new opportunities. As more people settled in these areas, new states wanted to be admitted to the Union. In 1849, California asked to join the Union as a free state. If this happened, the balance of the free and slave states would never be equal again. So what happened? Henry Clay, the Great Compromiser, back to the rescue with the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850 was a collection of five laws that admitted California as a free state. It also made a major amendment to the Fugitive Slave Law. This law was originally written into the Constitution in 1793, but it was rarely enforced. The new update stated that any slave who escaped from the South and made it to the North as a free man could actually be reclaimed by the Southern owners. Even after slaves achieved freedom in the North, they were still not safe. And because of this, the gruesome nature of slavery became more and more apparent to Northerners. After 1850, the South pivoted away from trying to maintain a balance between the free and slave states and more toward protecting the status quo. And the North, now seeing the brutality of slavery firsthand, also became uninterested in the balance. They saw a moral imperative to eliminate slavery in the country altogether. All of this came to a head in 1854 when the territories of Kansas and Nebraska wanted to become states. These territories were located here and here, right above the 3630 line agreed upon in the Missouri Compromise. So easy peasy, they'll join as free states, right? Wrong. 3630 was derailed by, uh, well, the railroad. Stephen Douglas, a Democratic senator from Illinois, introduced a bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. You see, Douglas wanted a transcontinental railroad to go through his state and needed Southern support. The Kansas-Nebraska Act would promote popular sovereignty as the method of determining slave and free states. Popular sovereignty was the belief that a territory should vote to determine if it would be a slave state or a free state. And remember, at the time, the voters of the country were almost exclusively white men. Despite northern states holding a majority in Congress at the time, President Franklin Pierce sided with Douglas and helped push the Kansas-Nebraska Act into law. The act eliminated the 3630 line and threw the area into chaos. Both northerners and southerners quickly rushed into the territory in the hopes of determining the upcoming election on whether or not slavery would be permitted. Pro-slavery settlers won the election but were charged with fraud by the anti-slavery settlers who refused to accept the results. The anti-slavery settlers held another election, but the pro-slavery settlers refused to vote. Thus, two separate and opposing legislators were formed within the Kansas Territory. And if you thought the two sides were having trouble sharing one country, imagine what happened when they tried to share one state. Violence soon erupted, and the area earned the nickname Bleeding Kansas as the death toll rose. Violence wasn't isolated to the territories either. In 1856, South Carolina Assemblyman Preston Brooks was so enraged with Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner that he cracked his cane over Sumner's head. And this happened right on the floor of Congress. Sumner was out of commission for over two years, and the attack fueled anti-slavery sentiment in the North. Brooks, on the other hand, was hailed as a hero in the South. The writing was on the wall. Words, diplomacy, and compromise were fading, and violence and conflict were taking over. The slave power conspiracy theory reached its height in 1857, 
with the Supreme Court ruling known as the Dred Scott decision. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled that blacks had no rights in the federal court. The written opinion of Justice Taney stated they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. For those who believed in the slave power theory, these words prove their case. We're heading toward the pivotal election of 1860, and of course, the divide between the slave states and the free states would be at the forefront. But there wasn't only disagreement between the two sections themselves, party politics had begun to crumble as well. Disagreements over the Kansas-Nebraska Act had created such unrest that many Northern Democrats left the party altogether and they ultimately formed a new party called the Republicans. The remaining Southern Democrats were still so divided that the party actually ran three candidates in the election of 1860, and it split the vote of the Southern states. Meanwhile, the new Republican Party ran only one candidate who took all of the states in the North, which is all he needed to win the election. That candidate was Abraham Lincoln, who would become the 16th president of the United States, or what was left of them. <laughs>